Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our latest productivity talk organized by the Asian Productivity Organization, where we feature guests who do interesting work at the nexus of policy, production, and technology in Asia and beyond. This is Paul Chait Kraperyun, and I'm with the Digital Programs and Information Unit, as well as the Public Sector Unit of the APO. The past two years of headlines have been full of stories around work. In the United States of America, there have been strikes against 178, 178 employers this year as workers raise grievances about wages, benefits, and quality of life. Similar stories can be found across the globe. At the same time, during this pandemic, we have seen the rise of remote and hybrid work with mostly white collar workers who are now able to work from home, which brings the promise of more flexibility and autonomy in the workplace. How can we make sense of these somewhat contradictory narratives? Uh, could the key be uh, at looking at work design? To explore this, we have Dr. Georgia Hay, Forest Prospect, fellow at the Future of Work Institute at Curtin University, Australia. She has a deep expertise in the areas of organizational psychology and work design. And she's also the president of the Georgians, an alumni organization of St. George's College at the University of Western Australia. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Hay. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, so before we get into the kind of uh, meat and potatoes of work design, maybe you could tell us a little bit about yourself um, how did you come to start working on work design and be interested in work design and also uh, what your involvement is with the Future of Work Institute? Sure. Uh, so I started out my studies with an interest in um, clinical psychology. Um, you know, I had a friend who was suffering from mental illness and really felt motivated to try and help people who are going through sort of similar struggles. Um, but when I started my studies, I was kind of opened up to the broader world of psychology and what that encompasses beyond um, the study and treatment of mental illness. Um, psychology is relevant to any sort of situation where you've got people involved, um, whether that be looking at social psychology, um, how children and their social skills and their um, kind of intellectual capabilities develop, but also in terms of the application of psychology to the workplace, which is inherently a, a group of people trying to coordinate and then do things together. So once I learned about organizational psychology, I think the 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 broad applicable nature of it to anyone who works really interested me. Um, and also, I suppose the idea of not just using psychology to treat illness or to treat, um, you know, what for want of a better phrase, um, you know, instances in which people are kind of um, below kind of functional levels, but the idea of using psychology to really optimize human functioning, to optimize productivity, but also to optimize well-being um, in the workplace where we spend so much of our lives. Um, so I had the, the very um, fortunate, I suppose, opportunity of, of somewhat sort of stumbling into um, working with Professor Sharon Parker um, during my honours degree and during my PhD studies. Um, and she really exposed me to both a model of research that's very collaborative and very impactful. You know, she was a professor teaching classes, but she was also out there consulting with the Mental Health Commission and, and massive organisations around um, work design. And so she also then was, was the one who introduced me to the topic of work design, which um, I find uh, interesting and, and appealing for a number of reasons. But I suppose, uh, first and foremost, the, the role of structures and psychosocial work structures, which we'll get into in a moment, in, in being at the root cause of a lot of the problems and challenges that we see in today's organisation. So I was lucky enough to meet her, started working with her, got sucked into the, the um the motivation for me personally of the research pathway um, and um, the last few years have been working with the Future of Work Institute um, initially um, uh, alongside Sharon specifically in a project but then more recently um, funded um, by the Forest Research Foundation um, to work on a specific project around work design and healthcare. Um, so I'm a, a research fellow doing um, a number of different projects at the moment including that healthcare project um, and I have many other colleagues who are similarly involved in a lot of different projects across industries, across sectors, um, a lot of them related to work design, but sometimes questions more broadly around recruitment, technology, anything that has to do with people in the workplace and a lot of the contemporary challenges that today's organizations face. 
Um, so that's the sort of space we're operating in. And, and I could spend a long time talking about all the nitty gritty of that, but um, let's let's chat a bit more about work design. Great, yeah, and I, I'm sure we can get back into more of uh, the future of work's broader scope later and maybe uh, its potential interest towards APO member countries. But yeah, let, let's get into it. Uh, so um, could you define work design for us? W what exactly is work design? What, what are the basic principles, et cetera? Sure, sure. Um, I have a couple of slides that I might just share um, to help. Mm -hmm. uh, there we go. Um, and I'll get my mouse from one screen to the other and uh, to help uh, orient, I suppose, everyone to the concept of work design, because it's somewhat intuitive, you know, work and design, you can kind of get an understanding, but the the, the academic definition is around the, the content and organization of tasks, activities, relationships, and responsibilities. So to make it a little bit more tangible, um, this is a, a sort of screenshot from a study um, that, or a experimental paradigm that we've used a couple of times. And you can, if you look at this doc, uh, this job, the, the orange box being a job, and you can get the sense that it's sort of an administrative job in, in a legal context. And you can see that the first four tasks that are being put in there are around um, photocopying, um, filing documents, um, putting them in the correct folders. And what we ask participants to do is to look at the remaining tasks on the right hand side of the screen and decide which tasks best fit that job. Um, if there's some leftover capacity, some leftover space, what tasks should this person who's already doing the tasks in the orange box, which ones should they do? And hopefully when you read through those tasks on the right-hand side, you can get a bit of a sense of how adding those tasks to the job would change what we would call the psychosocial work characteristics or the work design. Um, so whether that's to do with more photocopying and filing or is it something that perhaps is a little bit more social? So greeting and directing court visitors, um, collaborating with a colleague in terms of arranging meetings. So that hopefully gives you a bit more of a tangible flavor of what we mean when we talk about work design. And there are a number of different um, academic disciplines that are relevant to the discussion of work design that investigate work design. Some of them operate very much um, sort of in a physical sense and look at physical work characteristics. So whether that's looking at the degree to which a job exposes you to toxic fumes. Um, there are also the biomechanical elements of work design. So, um, you know, repetitive tasks, lifting heavy loads. I mean, more and more these days, we look at the biomechanical characteristics of office jobs as well around, you know, posture and, and the ergonomic design of our, of our um, sort of office setup. We can also look at cognitive characteristics. So um, you might think of someone who's working in airport security and they're monitoring the bags that come through the scanning system. Um, these sorts of excessive vigilant tasks where they're watching, 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 waiting for to identify the, the factor that's wrong or, or needs further investigation. Um, but specifically what we tend to focus on from a psychological perspective is what we would call the psychosocial characteristics of work. And so one example of this, um, which I'm sure I think a lot of us have probably experienced at some point um, in our career is what we would call um, perhaps a supervisor who's a bit quite hands-on, um, some might call micromanaging. And then what you're creating is, is a situation um, where the job lacks autonomy and lacks freedom to make your own decisions and your own choices. And that lack of freedom or lack of autonomy is one type of a psychosocial work characteristic. Uh, so we have a bit of a model in terms of all the different um, psychosocial work characteristics that have been developed and, and a nice little acronym that we call SMART. And so within that, broadly, what you can see is that when we talk about work characteristics, we have what we are called psychosocial resources. Um, so things that can kind of help you to achieve your work and to manage the demands of your work from a psychological motivational perspective. So is your job stimulating? Do you have a variety of things that you're doing or is it quite doing the same thing over and over again. Are you getting a sense of mastery? And this is quite a common theme across a lot of different psychological theories. If we're turning up to work feeling like we're not achieving anything, either because we don't have clarity over what our job is in the first place, um, or perhaps because we're not getting feedback from colleagues or from others about the, the effectiveness of what we're doing. Um, if we don't have that sense of mastery, long term, we can find it quite difficult to perform, um, let alone be innovative and be dynamic in our work. Um, agency is the autonomy that I mentioned earlier. 
relational is really, really important as well across a number of different psychological theories. Um, you know, we're social creatures, regardless of whether you're introverted or extroverted, we all require a degree of social interaction. So that's about in your job, do you have a lot of interaction with colleagues? Do you have a lot of interaction with people who perhaps are the beneficiaries of your work? Um, and do you have a lot of opportunity to interact with them and to get feedback from them and to get a sense that what you're doing is important and impactful for someone? And finally, we talk about um, the, the psychosocial demands. So whereas the resources kind of give you that energy, give you that capacity, the, the demands are the, the necessary parts of our job that might um, potentially sap that a little bit or, or put pressure on, on, on ourselves. So what are the, the time pressures that you experience in your work? What is the workload pressure that you experience? Um, also importantly, particularly from a psychological perspective, what are the emotional demands of your work? Um, you know, are you required to kind of put on a brave face or to, to appear in a particular way? And what are the emotional and psychosocial costs that that bears on you long term? So this is our way of, of thinking about what is work design. Um, and then we can look, and this is the reason that work design is so important, at the types of jobs that are prevalent um, globally. And there have been studies that have broken this down in terms of different countries, but broadly, what we would like to aim for is these active jobs that you can see on the screen. So we don't want to be in passive jobs where we're doing something that's really quite repetitive. So we have these low job resources. It's not very stimulating. I'm not getting much of a sense of achievement and I'm not really being put under much pressure to, to perform or to have, I don't have really have any reasonable sort of level of workload. Um, on the other hand, we don't want to be in a quite a constrained job this stressful job where I still don't have a lot of autonomy and variety, but now all of a sudden I'm being put under a lot of time pressure and a lot of workload pressure. Um, we have these what we call cushy jobs. And, and in theory, they sound kind of nice where, you know, you've got a lot of these job resources, you've got a lot of variety, you've got a lot of choice and autonomy, and you're not really being put under that much pressure. You don't have that much workload. And although, um, those are, are not nearly as bad as the passive and stressful jobs. They're not quite ideal. What optimally we like to see is a balance of the resources. Um, so the stimulation, the mastery, the autonomy and the relatedness and that to be balanced with a reasonable level of, of demands um, and kind of workload and a little bit of time pressure to kind of get you going. Um, what we see today, though, increasingly are these sort of hyperactive jobs where we have massively high demands and massively high resources. And you know, we often talk about in academia that although we have the wonderful freedom and a lot of autonomy and variety that um, you know, we're under increasing uh, pressure rather to, to perform and to pump out publications and, and um, a lot of other things that go along with that, which I'm sure a lot of professionals can relate to. So what we know is that when that balance between psychosocial work uh, resources and demands is off, either because we've got too many demands, not enough resources, or also in those situations where we've got really low resources and it's that repetitive, under-stimulating sort of work. Um, you can um, have a look at this um, Parker Review paper and then the wealth of literature that shows that this is critical, not just for, for preventing ill health and injury, but also for getting people who are coming to work who are interested in what they're doing, engaged, feel responsible for the outcomes of their work. And in particular, where we're increasingly requiring organizations to have employees who are agile and creative and identifying opportunities, um, identifying solutions to problems before they happen, rather than just come to work and do the day to day. Um, so for these reasons, because of this evidence, um, you know, we know that that work design is, is so important. So hopefully that gives everyone a bit of a foundation and a bit of an introduction into these concepts and, and why they're so relevant for today's workplaces. Great. Thanks, Georgia. Um, maybe you could get a little bit more into uh, the sort of benefits that uh, employees and employers might see if they really engage in the work design process. You mentioned motivation, but uh, of course there are other kind of relevant um, outcomes we might be interested in. Uh, productivity, of course, us being mm. ADO, um, learning or innovation. Maybe could you get into that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So, um, so as you mentioned, productivity, first and foremost, there have been a number of studies that have linked 
work design to um, individual performance, to team performance and productivity, um, as well as some studies, you know, un understandably, it's sometimes difficult to draw this link, but between work design and organizational performance. Um, motivation, so, uh, and this is a big one with autonomy, is that the, the kind of theory states, and it's been tested a number of times, that when you give people autonomy and freedom in their work, they are more likely to experience a sense of felt responsibility. So if I'm the one making the choices over how I do my work and when I do my work, I'm more likely to feel that that whether or not that works and the outcomes of my work are, are on me. And what that engenders is a, an increased sort of sense of motivation to perform well and to go above and beyond and be innovative and do the best possible work that I can do. Um, and I suppose similarly, you, you can imagine for, for outcomes more around innovation and creativity, that creating a work environment that offers a bit of variety, a bit of stimulation um, is important for employees being able to develop skills and have a broader perspective that, that you know, creates a creative mindset and, and is more linked to these creative outcomes. Um, and then I suppose also there is the social interactions and the social connections um, are, are instrumental for creativity as well, where we want to create an environment where people are able to, to work together, combine complementary perspectives and trigger collective creativity, um, which is often neglected when we think of creativity. We kind of think of a bit of an individual who kind of sits alone and has this kind of eureka brainstorm um, light bulb sort of moment and comes up with a creative solution but often it's those interactions that can really ignite the seed for creativity so so we find that it's individuals motivation they feel responsible they feel connected to their work and therefore the turnover is reduced as well um, that also reduces what we call presenteeism so you know, it's all, it's awful when we have employees leave, but what perhaps is arguably even more costly, if not equally costly, is employees who stay, but aren't engaged with the work that they're doing um, and are not performing at their best ability. So we find that when they have that social connection and particularly that stimulation that comes through the variety, that they're more engaged in what they're doing, they stay for longer, um, they perform better, um, you know, it, it really sort of ticks all the boxes that are also quite intertwined when we think of productivity. Um, so it's really that psychological perspective and understanding the motivational mechanisms where we can paint this quite compelling um, evidence-based picture that these work characteristics are quite important. Great, and um, maybe that's a good jumping off point uh, and to connect it back to productivity. Mm. So. Uh, a lot of the, for example, kind of management interventions or organizational interventions that maybe our, our listeners and people who are more familiar with APR are more uh, knowledgeable about are, are things kind of like lean management, um, things that kind of approach organizations from like a process perspective, looking to mm. maybe kind of doing these things like quality management. I'm wondering how, is there a sort of perspective shift that's needed to understand work design if you're coming from... Uh, that sort of background and are these kind of two sorts of views on work are they compatible or are they mm. are they contradictory in some ways mm. i think it's a really interesting point um and i think it speaks to um what i mentioned earlier around what attracted me to the concept of work design the study of work design as being about looking at the root cause of a problem um and and i think sometimes understandably, organizations can perhaps have a tendency to apply um, more surface-based um, or surface-targeted, I suppose, approaches. Um, and I actually have a nice little slide that I might um, that I might just share with you if I scroll down and find it here. Um, that, you know, when we look at the symptoms of challenges that we might face around um, stress or low performance or low innovation, that, and this is, these are not necessarily the strategies that you mentioned, but, but kind of we can look to solutions or programs or training that are well known and apply that as a solution um, when that may not actually address the underlying problem, um, which, you know, in, in many instances is the structure of the psychosocial structure of work. And that we, if perhaps there is an issue with demands that are not tolerable, you know, massive workload issues, and we put, oh, it's someone underperforming and we need to send them on a training program, um, that that cannot actually address sort of the underlying issue. Um, another example that I'll um, that I'll give once I find it. Here we go. Um, and this is another sort of simulation that we do. 
um, is that, you know, this example um, describes uh, Karen who works at a warehouse company and she's filling in these online orders. She has a handheld device that she uses. She's told what to get and how long or how fast she's expected to get it. She moves, she's running to pick up all the items and she repeats this process 15 times a day. And what the organization has found is that, you know, about 15% of the time, her response time is slower than it should be. And we asked people um, in this sort of simulation, which of these is the best approach to take to solve this problem? So some of them are about observing Karen's behavior to see how fast she's really moving. Um, we could look at pay related um, sort of implications. So reducing pay, we could send her on a training program. Uh, we could advise Karen to improve her physical fitness, asking her why her times aren't met. And so you can see that there are, um, hopefully that these reflect a number of the different options that, that organizations and managers would be likely to, to pick um, in response to performance issues like this. What we can see is that some of these strategies, the, the implication or the underlying rationale is that in this case, it's Karen who's at fault. Um, and that this is got has got to be a problem with either her motivation, her willingness, or just her ability to perform the task. We have some that are sort of in a bit of a middle ground, um, and that at least exhibits some indication of involving Karen in the decision making, which again, we know that autonomy and also that firsthand experience can provide useful input into improving organizational outcomes. But there is another option that I think just as human beings, and we found it to some degree empirically, we are sometimes just used to um, looking at the surface level solutions, wanting to, to make what we'd call these um, attribution errors of blaming the person rather than exploring the situation. And so to come back to your question, um, I don't think there's a necessary incompatibility between some of these management approaches and designing effective work from a psychosocial perspective. But I think if the manager, if these management approaches are used as a band-aid solution rather than addressing the underlying structural issues, there can be, um, you know, that there's a limitation there. And I think if these uh, management approaches put excessive focus on productivity, which might indeed be increased in the short term, but if there are psychosocial costs such as, um, you know, putting excessive workload on employees or restructuring work such that it is understimulating, super repetitive and tightly controlled, you know, what we would argue is that long term, you're going to see maybe an initial increase in productivity, but a long term um, increase in turnover, um, drop in well-being and these sort of more long term insidious, difficult to measure effects um, that will then ultimately feed back into productivity. So, um, you know, what we find in this research is that there is a basic fundamental tendency to pick these sort of um, blame the person strategies, um, that there are pot potentially different um, values that might shape individuals' decision-making around how to design better work, that people who are from a values perspective sort of have an inclination towards things being more controlled and more organized, um, tend to create these more structured, um, controlled jobs. And that people who tend to be a little bit more, um, it's called openness to experience, so a bit more accepting of different views, um, a bit more open-minded, tend to be more comfortable with giving individuals autonomy in these sort of simulations. So um, we are trying to understand this a little bit more and trying to understand what are the different factors that contribute to the way that managers make decisions about work design, so this kind of top-down formal decision-making process. But also what's really important is acknowledging that employees have the ability to varying degrees, but, but an ability to what we would call craft their jobs. So different ways, whether that's um, a cognitive reframing or whether that's a, a real kind of tangible conversation with a manager about taking on some new interesting projects or having a little bit more say about something in their work. They have this ability to, to craft their job in a way that's um, uh, more aligned with these motivational elements. And perhaps that's something that is a little bit overlooked when we take a focus on these sort of, um, you know, lean management practices and other management methodologies. We kind of don't give quite enough attention to the roles that employees have 
in having a say over and making their own changes about their work design. So I suppose in, in, in summary, in answer to your question, um, you know, it depends on the methodology. Um, I don't think they're necessarily incompatible, but perhaps I think for, for a lot of people, whether they use these methodologies or not, it is absolutely a perspective shift to think about an organisation as a group of people with psychological needs and to be comfortable with giving autonomies a little bit of, sorry, giving employees a little bit of autonomy or a little bit of variety. What that does is goes against our fundamental human need to have things controlled and to reduce uncertainty. Um, but, you know, we know from the research that we do have to, we have to fight those a little bit because this type of work is really important. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to get into kind of, um, it seems like a lot of the, I would imagine there would be a lot of hesitancy on, at least on the part of the manager in kind of accepting the sort of premise of a work designer, maybe even if they intellectually um, accept it, there might be an emotional kind of inertia because I, I think it's it's a common worry uh, among managers that, for example, if you let the employee kind of dictate or have an influence over their tasks, that they'll end up reducing the amount of work they do or um, maybe they're important tasks that are difficult but kind of undesirable to do and they'll end up not being done. Hmm. Uh, I think maybe an example you can see with that is there's a lot of fear. Maybe there's still fear, but there's a lot of initial fear I know in a lot of organizations about letting people work remotely. Hmm. Uh, and, and the manager's thinking, well, I can't see them in the office day to day. How am I going to make sure that they're actually doing their work? So you can see that this is kind of a common, maybe you could say mm -hmm. like a psychological disposition on a certain type of manager or on managers in general. Mm. Oh, absolutely. And you know, what we actually find from um, our early experimental evidence around yeah, how people make these work design decisions is that um, if you've been as a manager afforded autonomy in your own role, you're more likely to then create these slightly more autonomous jobs. Um, so it's, it, and, and I suppose also actually um, from some early qualitative research that I'm doing, um, it's a similar, um, I suppose, logic, but kind of the opposite, where um, with a sample of entrepreneurs, what we've found is that it's the entrepreneurs who have previously in another job had an experience of really bad work design, where they've been in a really kind of tightly controlled, micromanaged job, and they have that firsthand experience of how awful that feels and the way that that did stifle their performance and their creativity, that they then go out and kind of try and make a conscious decision to give a bit of autonomy to their employees. So it definitely seems like it takes a lot to kind of, um, whether that's a firsthand experience or a global pandemic to, mm -hmm. to kind of force um, us into these sort of, um, yeah, both just doing things differently in general, which is difficult. But then as you say, it's, you know, you're giving, it's there's a sort of a business risk involved um, and, and it creates, um, yeah, the space for, for things to, to go wrong. I suppose what I would say to that is that is to first acknowledge that and I think would be um, yeah, naive to not acknowledge that it, that it is something new and it is something that creates uncertainty and creates a degree of risk. What I would say is that it's firstly not an all or nothing approach. It's not about giving um, employees free reign over everything. Um, it's about exploring different ways in which some of the work characteristics can be tweaked and sort of a sort of experimental um, sort of iterative approach around crafting this job on different jobs to um, to address some of the the weaknesses where those psychosocial resources might not exist um, and I think uh, something that's also come up again and again particularly about this idea of autonomy which I think is perhaps one of the most challenging um, uh, characteristics from a managerial perspective is that it's not it's autonomy, but paired with um, accountability and still paired with structure around that job. So, um, so I think there are there are challenges associated with it. Fundamentally, as humans, we we kind of uh, our brains don't quite work that way. There are business challenges associated with it. But I think if um, and and we have some principles um, and some information that perhaps I can send through around. Um, not just thinking about the work characteristics that you want to change and you want to be there, but thinking about the work design process as any other change process, a process that's planned, a process that has stakeholders involved, a process that has milestones and a process that's measured. So are we seeing the results that we wanted to see by giving employees more autonomy? Um, are we seeing the downsides that we thought we'd see? Um, how can we address those if they do exist? So. I would say it's about 
not thinking about it as this massive leap. It's about baby steps and it's about having a clear and defined process in place, um, which, you know, unfortunately often, well, not unfortunately, but an additional challenge is that that psychological expertise, um, I think it's changing a little bit and definitely in Australia, but um, having that expertise around work design, organisational psychology, organisational change is often not in-house in organisations. Um, you know, it might be around getting consultants in, which can bring its own um, resistance and challenges sometimes in organisations. Um, so the organisations that are lucky to have that expertise in-house, I think are definitely at a sort of advantage. But whether it's working with, you know, a research groups such as ourselves to do that hand in hand from a research perspective, it's whether it's looking at upskilling current employees from a work design organizational psychology perspective or management employees rather, um, or whether it's about thinking about how to bring those capabilities in house, um, because I think you can definitely embark on something like this and then be kind of a bit overwhelmed by, by the challenges and the complexity of it, um, I suppose is a final note that I would make. Great. And since we're kind of getting into it already, uh, I know some of the kind of important research around work design right now is on kind of uh, what's termed as the antecedents of work design. So what are all the things that are necessary in order to even start this process? So maybe you could talk about that a bit and then kind of take us through to how that then becomes work design in an organization. Mm, yeah, sure. So so I think um, I've got a couple of slides that might that might fit with this. And the one actually I had up earlier um, around this model of, of influences on work design, um, which I think looks like it's showing now, if I'm correct. Sure, yeah. Let's yeah, let's fantastic. There we go. Um, so we can think about it, and we love to think about things in research from kind of like a, a multi-level perspective. So, um, and I touched on it earlier, that there have been documented variation in the quality of work design based on the, um, uh, the, the country, um, but and also based on different countries that have similar sort of political approaches. And you can imagine that the political context, the economic context and the regulatory context shapes what is possible in terms of work design. So shapes what is possible perhaps in terms of working hours or shapes what is possible um, perhaps to a lesser degree, but possibly in terms of, you know, can we work from home? Can we work flexibly? Is that possible in our, in our, in our context? And then from an organizational perspective, is that possible in terms of our organizational policies, our organizational structure? Those will have a flow on effect to what is possible in terms of work design. And our organizational strategy will have a flow on effect to what is um, what is favored or prioritized in terms of work design. You know, are we envisioning our organization as an agile, innovative organization? Are we looking to enter a new market? Um, do we then need to facilitate new ideas within the organization? Might we then look to give people more autonomy and more variety to, to create those new ideas? So it depends on the organizational context massively. Um, and I suppose a little bit in between higher level and, and organizational is different industries will have different pressures that will allow or favor different ways of structuring work. And then we also have the local context. So um, what's happening in the group, what's happening in the team, which other teams is, is the team working with and what are the pressures in that sense? And then the, the factors that we touched on earlier, for example, around personal values, personality, will also kind of come to bear on the, the nature of work and work design. So if I flick to, um, which one might be, I, I really like this example as a good example of, um, I suppose, a change in work design and what that might look like. Um, so the example of midwifery, and this was a study that um, not myself, but some colleagues did. So you can think about, I suppose, the three kind of trimesters of of, um, of having a child and, and traditionally how this particular hospital would structure their midwives who are looking after um, the mothers or mothers-to-be is that you would have a group of midwives who look after prenatal, the first trimester. You have a group of midwives who look after women in the second trimester and a group of midwives who look after women in the third trimester. And that was how they had originally approached um, the, the, the work design. They changed that to what they called a caseload model, where instead they would have a midwife or a group of midwives who look after a group of women from the very beginning to, to the very end of the pregnancy. And what you can imagine is that that changes quite significantly some of these psychosocial work characteristics, um, one of which um, we call task identity. And that's very much about do you see something through from beginning to end and do you get a sense of the outcomes of your work? So you can probably imagine if you're looking after prenatal midwives or sorry, prenatal and mothers, um, 
you're, you're then handing them on to the next group of midwives and not really knowing what, what happens, not really knowing was the pregnancy successful, did my work have an impact, and so on and so forth. And what they actually found was that um, they randomly assigned the midwives to these two different ways of working and found that that caseload model where they had um, this broader perspective and a more kind of um, complete perspective of their work um, was better for the hospital and, and better for midwives as well. So you can get a bit of a sense of um, what that redesign looks like in practice. But I'm sure you can also imagine that to, you know, particularly in a hospital setting, particularly in, in the setting of childbirth, which is quite, quite complex, quite high risk sometimes, that going from one caseload model to the other, or sorry, one way of working to the other requires a lot of careful thinking and, and careful change. Um, so there can definitely, and that's, I think, I think it's a good example of where you can see how important the redesign process of figuring out what's the best approach, how we're going to measure if it's the best approach, and how we're going to implement the best approach um, it is particularly important. Um, so I think that's probably um, a, a good example that I'll end on to answer that question. Right, yeah, that, that, that's very interesting. And I guess it kind of speaks to the importance of um, data in kind of making these sorts of decisions. Uh, mm. I would imagine that I'm not sure if every organization uh, that, for example, you've worked with or that you've researched has had access to kind of meaningful data. Uh, maybe they do have meaningful data in terms of like the relevant outcomes like sales or in this case, kind of successful births, but do they have uh, meaningful data in terms of like employee satisfaction or, mm. uh, you, you know, is it is it that common for organizations to be asking, like, do you find this job meaningful? I, I think it's increasingly common. I think, um, you know, as with any kind of innovation, you have both a bit of a sense of kind of early adopters who are at the forefront, who are maybe asking these questions. But within that, you probably have, um, you know, people who are adopting something perhaps without, with the best intentions, but um, adopting it not in a rigorous way or, you know, using questions that aren't necessarily um, evidence-based and known to be the best ways to ask these sorts of questions. Um, so, so I think there are some challenges around um, ensuring that organizations approach to asking these questions, whether that's through surveys, whether it's through focus groups, through um, even exit interviews with employees, that that's done in a um, careful and sort of rigorous way. But I do think it's it's increasingly common. Um, I think what perhaps will be the next challenge is, well, once we have that data, um, how do we improve these numbers? And I think that's where we can come to that back to that iceberg challenge of, okay, well, if we've got poor in employee engagement, we'll put a slide in the office. So we'll have a breakfast bar and everyone can have free lunch or something. And, and that's, you know, great for a little while, but doesn't necessarily address the underlying problem of um, perhaps poor employee engagement or dissatisfaction. So, so I think we're seeing it increasingly um, and, and it's, it's definitely kind of spreading and becoming more common, um, but there's a challenge around how to do it well and then how to act on that data. Right. Um, and to go back to the kind of graphic that you talked about, where you're showing mm -hmm. the kind of different levels of uh, antecedents. So you have kind mm -hmm. of individual, local level, and then kind of uh, you have things that are like maybe regulators affecting mm. kind of labor policy, for instance, uh, or like occupational uh, health and safety. Um, what does the kind of ecosystem of work design look like? like what are the things that each actor kind of affects? How do they relate to each other? And, and kind of how does like work design, how does the frameworks of work design that you know kind of navigate these sorts of relationships? Hmm, that's a really good question. Um, this this idea of understanding the factors that affect work design, I love the description of it as sort of an ecosystem, um, is still relatively early in, in its stage. And you know, we know that. Um, and that, that paper that that framework is from um, in more detail outlines the different ways in which um, uh, variables at those levels can influence work design. So it's a bit of a, a, a easy answer, but we know it's it's a combination of all of those things um, and that we can't just, for example, leave it to individual managers to make the good decisions under a host of pressures that are pushing them in the other direction. So we know that addressing it at all of those levels is important, which is why um, having the, the organizational psychology work design expertise and understanding within the organization is important um, from an employee perspective at the managerial level, but is also critical to have um, regulators and understand that 
organizations, um, you know, whether they're highly technological in a very technological um, industry, which, you know, more and more these days is every industry, but even in, in all types of organizations that these fundamental psychosocial principles um, are, are really underlie a lot of the, the challenges that we face. Um, unfortunately, though, again, we're pushing against kind of the barrier of um, it's both uh, increasing the expertise and understanding of these, these, these issues. But as I said, it's, you know, the effect of an intervention, for example, on well-being or on turnover even are often um, long term. Um, they're often difficult to measure. Or again, if you don't have that background um, in psychology, they're difficult to know. How, what are the questions that I ask people to get a reliable measure of this psychological um, phenomena? And, and because of that, that somewhat intangibility and that long time scale, I think it becomes particularly difficult from a regulatory perspective. Um, you know, particularly in, in Australia, for example, where we have quite, um, you know, it's difficult to, to sustain um, long term sort of uh, focus from a political perspective because you get, you know, the next election comes around and that's what can I promise within the next couple of years. Um, so we face those political um, pressures from our system, I suppose, that, that are sometimes a bit in contrast with the long term um, and sometimes intangibility of the psychosocial, psychological um, factors, but again, that are often at the root cause of what is a more tangible changes in performance, um, changes in efficiency. Um, so I think it's particularly a challenge at that regulatory level, um, but we see that how influences at every stage um, is, is important. Right. And um, is there kind of a common understanding, or maybe you have a specific view on this of kind of leading organizations or sectors or even countries when it comes to work design practice or good work design practice? Mm, oh, that's an interesting point. I think it's still relatively early um, in, in, in many organizations. What, what I've personally found, um, I tend to do a lot of research in the healthcare context. Um, and what I love about working with healthcare practitioners is that they understand research. Um, they understand evidence. Um, you know, everything they do is evidence-based, whether it's evidence from a public policy, um, healthcare policy perspective, I'm sorry, public health perspective, or whether it's evidence from a, you know, medical trials, clinical trials perspective. You know, everything that they do is evidence-based. And I think that mindset predisposes them or allows them to be more accepting to some degree of these sorts of um, ideas in this research. Um, Equally, though, you know, I tend to work with with public hospitals and they're under a lot of pressure to just get things done faster, get more patients, you know, through the doors, um, you know, and and to some degree to be risk averse, which can again lead to kind of quite bureaucratic um, organisations with a lot of policies and practices in place to, to regulate everything. Um, and so there I think there's the challenge around, well, how do we still you know mitigate risk but still... Um, create jobs that are where, where, where clinicians who have so much wealth of expertise have the autonomy to exercise their decision um, their decision autonomy over the work that they're doing. So, so I think that the healthcare environment is a particularly interesting one. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's an example that, that personally I probably have the most um, sort of experience with, but it's, it's coming in pockets, I think, in different organizations. I think in, in the entrepreneurial context and startup organizations, um, or, or organizations that are kind of affiliated with that environment, like your Facebook and your Google, um, who are kind of synonymous with this innovation, um, tend to be leading in some ways in, in being read, readily open to adopting new ways of structuring work um, and this kind of, not trial and error, but this um, kind of prototyping, tweaking, experimenting when it comes to work structure, which I think is a bit of the mindset that you need. But to some degree, they're, they're also sort of... Um, some of the the uh, the most avid uh, users of what are perhaps more just kind of hype or or putting the slides in the middle of the office or you know to some yeah, degree taking true. quite surface level solutions to some of these fundamental psychosocial problems. So mm -hmm. um, I think those are the two sort of industries. If 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 the second is really an industry um, or areas that I think is interesting to to explore these ideas in. Yeah, um, the, your example kind of like. The tech company also reminds me mm. that, uh, well, from what I've read, that um, work design, maybe the first application, I don't know if this would be considered like the modern approach to work design, but a lot of it was applied to, for example, like call centers, 
mm. jobs that are kind of maybe they were emphasizing more of the cognitive load or the cognitive demand part of part of work design uh, as opposed to the psychosocial mm. uh, component of work design mm. but have we seen this sort of expansion now towards like white collar jobs jobs that you wouldn't everyone would consider oh these are nice jobs anyway mm. people don't already get a lot of meaning and say like professional identity and status from these jobs so we don't need to focus on them have we mm. seen that sort of shift happen Mm, yeah, definitely. I think it's a really interesting point. Um, and, you know, some of the earliest work design research was, um, as you mentioned, around call centers, but also the factory floor. Um, mm. And, you know, kind of came from from these sort of what were the initial kind of seeds of, of not of work design, but of just a general focus on employees as, as people and trying to make organizations more productive. Um, but that approach was that very um, sort of Tayloristic how do we maximize the efficiency of every moment through control um, and through tight monitoring? Um, but as you say, what, what that has led to is both a change in the perspective to how do we make what perhaps were otherwise quite repetitive, monotonous, unengaging jobs more engaging. Um, but, but as you say, it's also a little bit about how do we um, apply these principles to other jobs to either, um, you know, perhaps you might have a job that's incredibly stimulating but still quite controlled. So, so, you know, even though there are, there's a some element of these psychosocial resources, taking a broader view to um, all the ways in which jobs can be enriching and fulfilling. Um, we're, we're actually seeing a little bit of, of research also now around to, to what degree is it sort of a linear relationship between having these psychosocial resources and all these positive outcomes that we talk about. And what I mean by that is, is there a point at which it becomes too much? You know, is there a point where there's too much autonomy and too much stimulation and too much variety for either our brains to kind of cognitively handle or, um, yeah, is there too much um, with respect to performance and, and innovation? Um, so there's some early research kind of trying to figure out if there's a bit of more of a curvilinear effect and there's sort of maybe there's a sweet spot of some of these um, characteristics. Um, but I definitely think when it comes to some of the demands um, that we have, for example, in white collar jobs that are perhaps a bit more meaningful, a bit more traditionally stimulating, that there is only so much that that can outweigh a massive workload and working under massive time pressure. Mm -hmm. And that's where you can see, perhaps if we think back to that Karen example, even though it's not a white collar job, um, we might look to those employees who have this meaning and this stimulation, but are performing poorly and be, be inclined to send them on a training program. And, and again, apply these band-aid solutions when what's ultimately the, the problem is, is workload. Um, it then becomes a really tricky, complex question of how to manage workload um, and still maintain a, you know, a profitable business. But unless you do that, you're, you know, you're not going to solve that problem. And, and if anything, you're going to spend more money on training and slides and things that, that aren't going aren't to address that. So, so I think there, there, there's still a focus on what these sort of traditionally understimulating jobs. And I think there's an increased focus on other types of work. And particularly as we're bringing in, um, as changes are being, you know, as work design is being changed, not with the intention to change work design, but because new technologies are being brought into organizations. And there's a role for thinking about how do we actively design work um, around these technologies rather than let the technology dictate our work design. Um, and then, yeah, I suppose that the other point around still needing to address the 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 demands side of work design in, in some of these white collar jobs as well. Yeah. Uh, so actually, now that you mentioned kind of technology, maybe you could talk us through uh, what's work design's kind of evolving relationship with some of these new technologies that are kind of that might possibly or already have dramatically changed the way that mm. people work mm, absolutely um I, I mean it's it's what i kind of hinted at earlier i think fundamentally what we the the default approach and it not through anyone's kind of wrongdoing but just through the way that um, you know, is the default is that we've got this new technology that's either disrupting the whole industry or perhaps it's just a, you know, a new way of communicating that we'd like to introduce into our organization and putting the technology kind of at the forefront rather than in tandem with people. Um, whether that's, you know, because of just a particular fascination with the technology or, or because of seeing the technology is kind of doing the more important part, um, wh whatever that mindset comes from. Um, implementing the technology without adequate attention to 
the surrounding processes and then the way in which people's jobs are, are, are impacted. Um, and, you know, what we're seeing is that even in industries where the technology is really kind of revolutionising the way that work is done and really taking on some of these increasingly complex tasks, that there's still a role for people to play. Um, and I suppose one example that, that I've particularly been doing a lot of work in is, um, as I mentioned, in healthcare, but specifically um, in the, the realm of genetics um, and diagnosing um, particularly uh, children with, with rare genetic diseases. I'm not a medical doctor, I'm not a geneticist, but I can tell you that the world of genetics has changed massively over the last even five years, 10 years. Um, the possibilities that have been opened up with genetic sequencing, um, genomic sequencing, and the ability to, to, to identify the genetic cause of particular diseases is just incredible. Um, uh, despite that, or kind of in tandem with that though, there is still a massive role for geneticists and for other medical specialists to play in deciding which tests to do, um, analyzing the data that comes from that, that, that screening and those tests, and still making a judgment around, um, is this sufficient evidence to make this diagnosis? And then what does this diagnosis mean for the patient and their family and how do we manage um, and support them through this kind of journey? So technology has advanced massively. I'm sure it will continue to advance and to continue to change those jobs. But, you know, what we're finding is that um, that in, in the study and the work that I've been doing with these teams that are doing the diagnosis with the input of the technology, is that still in, in many cases, the technology is incredibly helpful and it unlocks kind of the beginning of the, the figuring out what's going on with the patient. But still it's um, getting people in the room together who are from different specialty backgrounds, who have an openness and an ability to um, be vulnerable and make silly suggestions and, and create a particular climate of creativity. And, and then to be able to, to work together, to ask the right questions, to trigger the right ideas. So to facilitate this human process of, well, we've got this information, what does it mean? What could it be? Um, and so I think that's just a fantastic example of an industry where the technology is changing massively, what's possible is changing massively. But what that still means is that you've got a patient who we, you know, they suspect has a rare disease, I've got a, a list of 10,000 different options that's growing because new diseases are being discovered every day. I've got this fantastic technology that I can use to, to analyze um, their, their genes and to figure out what's going on with them. But there's still that central um, role of the human actor and, and in the social element of the team in being that last kind of frontier between using all that wealth of knowledge and technology and, and getting a diagnosis for patients. Mm. It seems like, uh, it seems to me that you could have a very reflexive kind of perspective on the relationship of technology and, and people because obviously there people kind of influence how technology is integrated into the working life and also at the same time you can view specific technologies as I guess affecting some of the specific resources like does, does this technology make mm -hmm. uh, the specific kind of routine work less routine or more interesting mm -hmm. um, so yeah that, that, that's quite an interesting example uh, from the medical field I'm wondering, mm -hmm. what if we talk about things that kind of, because I wonder how much uh, work design or the current thinking around work design is centered on a certain view of like an organization. Uh, mm. For example, there, that you have kind of these manager and employee relationships. Mm. And I know technology is creating a lot of new, basically like organizations that are fairly decentralized. I'm not sure mm. how much you, I, obviously Uber is a great example, but also you have kind of things emerging now like, these the idea of like decentralized autonomous organizations, DAOs. You have sort of uh, Amazon has a platform called MTurk where it's like mm -hmm. it's like very task rabbit. You just kind of give people like very small, very bit sized tasks and they do it. So has work design as a framework or an approach been applied to kind of these very different working relationships mm, where yeah. you don't really have the same kind of repeated interaction between like a manager and an employee? Uh, you might not even really know the person you're doing something for mm. or you're engaging with them is like one time. Mm. Mm. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that that's the the impact of that is sort of twofold. Um, one is, as you say, it has those types of work, those types of organizations, if, if you know, if you call them them and, and yeah, what does it mean to be an employee now um, mm. has direct impacts on work design. You know, like you said, this idea of I didn't even really know who I'm working for. Um, 
that that element of of not knowing um, what actually is the impact of the work that I'm doing, who is it affecting, and how is it affecting them? Which again is that um, is a very fundamental kind of psychological driver of well-being and, and performance and continued effort. Um, that's that's you know direct impact on work design in that sense. Um, and then what what I think it also does, and this ties back to our conversation earlier around um, regulators and the higher level impacts on work design, is perhaps it it opens the the ecosystem up a little bit for regulators to have more of a say in terms of work design because they're not so much um, their influence is not so much being filtered through traditional organizational structures and 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 managerial sort of decisions. Um, so I think perhaps from from you know a regulatory perspective, there is more um, onus being being put on on regulators around and and you know that's a conversation that's happening a lot around how do we regulate these sorts of industries from not just a psychological perspective but from an economic yeah. perspective. Um, the, you know, research on work design, the research itself is, is slowly catching up. You know, sometimes we struggle a little bit in research with, um, you know, we do things very thoroughly, but sometimes we take a bit longer um, to, to catch up to these sorts of trends. So I think there's some research coming out now around this sort of gig work um, and, and issues that come with that in terms of well-being. Um, but, but yeah, so I'm, I'm very excited to see how, how the work design research kind of T- starts to tap into a little bit more these sort of different forms of organizations because it has been historically um as we said initially focused on factory the factory floor and this very specific view of work in that sense coming more focused on organizations and particularly the introduction of technology and the human technology interface but now as you say i think that is that next frontier is well but the regardless of technology because of technology probably the organization itself is just looking massively different. So um, mm. I definitely think that's the next frontier of work design research. Mm. Um, and you mentioned kind of the opening role for regulators mm. and kind of keeping on that topic of kind of public sector. When you're mentioning certain jobs might be like extremely demanding or too varied, it made me think, mm. uh, you know, a lot of like political executive jobs, for example, like being the president of the United States, if you could approach that job from like a work design perspective, mm. maybe you wouldn't have it structured the way it is. Maybe it's too mm. demanding for any one person. So I'm I'm wondering if there's any research or any view you can share on the mm. idea of how does work design interact with like public sector work, uh, whether oh, they're kind of civil servants or even mm. uh, like legislators, political representatives. Mm. Are there kind of unique things to, to look at or? Mm. I think that's, that's honestly, that's something that um, at least, um, you know, the, the colleagues I'm working with and myself haven't, uh, actually, sorry, I'm just, as I said, filtering in my brain through all the different projects that we're involved <laughs> sure. in. The, the p- specific example of people in those very, um, like very high level um, political um, positions, n- not that I'm aware of, but I mm. agree. It's, you know, it's a very particular types of demands and a particular volume of demands that's placed on those yeah. individuals, um, which probably to some degree is is practically unavoidable but you know how could you engineer those jobs so that they have those resources to or they have the people around them who have the resources to to support them um we have done i mean as we've talked about already plenty of healthcare work um or work in the healthcare sector rather um we have um uh, some of my colleagues have done some work around um looking at the the police force um and how to um yeah sort of re-engineer that type of work to be um, I mean, it's obviously for, for many reasons, very stimulating, meaningful work, but there are challenges that come along with that. So um, how to to kind of re-engineer that work um, in a sense. But but I think the, the, the more specifically the example that you mentioned around these very, um, you know, critical, high level um, political jobs that have very particular types of demands, I think would be a fascinating, um, a fascinating research process. Mm. Uh, I, I want to kind of follow that up with another kind of broad, broader question. Uh, I wonder if you could tell me, compared to the kind of trend of not necessarily work design research, but the structure of work in general, uh, if you're comfortable answering this, sort of compared to maybe jobs in like the post-World War II era that people sometimes look back quite fondly on, mm. uh, the idea of kind of staying with one company for, for your whole life, mm. do you think work has gotten less engaging has work design sort of regressed or have we mm. kind of even unintentionally gotten better at work design hmm. that's really interesting i mean the 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 um the evidence i think it was the the initial um uh research 
over the last sort of more more recent years, so I think it's perhaps uh, 10 to, to 15 years, um, there's a bit of evidence that work design has gotten worse and is, is definitely not getting better right. at, from a global perspective. Um, and that's meaning those, um, yeah, either under-stimulating or over-demanding, that, that mis mismatch between job resources and job demands um, is definitely getting a bit worse. Um, you know, at least in, in my, from a personal, I suppose, or professional perspective, um, you know, I speak to people who have been working in, in academia and in the research university context for a long time. And, you know, they kind of reflect on days earlier in their career where they could finish, uh, you know, finish work early on a Wednesday and go play golf. Um, you know, there, there are definitely, I think, that increase in demands um, and this constant, particularly the public sector, kind of push to do more with less. Um, so, so I think there are more... Um, more pressures, and that comes from also, I suppose, a broader increased tendency to, to want to measure productivity and to this mindset of wanting to continually improve productivity. You know, it's not okay just to be the same. We need to be better and better, and we need to be better than our competitors. And, I mean, just logically, you know, that can only work for so long when you're working with, with you know, people and, and human resources, and that will eventually have to come at a cost of something. Um, and again, that cost tends to be the intangible, more long-term people-related sort of factors. So, so I think it'll be really interesting um, over the next sort of 10, 20 years, both with the introduction of technology, but just with this general trend of wanting to be more and more productive as to where work design and and um, employee motivation and well-being um, what happens to, to those sorts of initiatives or the focus on those elements? Um, because in many ways, it seems like we're kind of coming towards a little bit of a, a cliff in, in to some degree. Um, but as you say, um, alongside that, we've had more of a recognition. I mean, you know, even just mental health in general, there were, were you know, a time where that was taboo to talk about and, you know, people should kind of just, there were particular stigma around mental health and mental illness, um, around kind of, you know, just toughening up and, and just, just getting over it which has, um, at least here, definitely um, passed quite substantially. And that's, I think, broadening to well-being in the workplace is now seen as oh, that's definitely important. It's not just a fluffy, nice-to-have thing. It's, it's, it's important. It's a, it's a human rights issue, um, mm. but it's also an um, organisational issue. Um, so I think even though there is some evidence that work design is getting a little bit worse in terms of the mismatch between demands and resources, I think societally and sort of culturally, there's an increasing acceptance of the the, the constructs that surround work design, meaning well-being and 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 motivation, that they're important. Um, I think it's just that it's just that gap between oh, it's important, but how do we make it happen? Um, how do we navigate the change process? What does that look like? To to again, I know well-being is bad, but how do I fix that? Um, I think that's the main main challenge we face, and that that is particularly I think where we need a better bridge, um, at least in Australia, and, and I think to different degrees globally, a better bridge between the, the research that's coming out of universities um, and the practical strategies that are implemented in organizations and by regulators. Hmm. And, and are you a work optimist or a pessimist? If you're kind of looking out at that time span you were talking about, kind of these 10, 15 years, do you think do you think work, let's, we can even talk about, you can talk about a specific sector, you can talk about just hmm. the context of Australia, but do, do you think work will get better in terms of employee motivation, morale, people's sense of kind of engagement with their work? Mm, I think so. And and I think so both to, to, to motivate myself. <laughs> um, but, but I think what has been really, you know, as much as it's challenging and awful in so many ways what's been happening with the pandemic, I think what it to some degree, what it and, and other instances of, of, of this shows is that, you know, when there, when it gets to a certain point, either because an environmental factor like a pandemic is forcing us to be a particular way, or when people are, you know, kind of saying and showing, hey, the way that we're doing things isn't working, it might look either productive on the balance sheet, or, um, you know, might be seeing these particular outcomes. But if there's a big enough voice to say that, either we need more autonomy, or, this work is just really boring and I'm not going to be staying here any longer. And maybe that ties to what you mentioned around um, people being more willing to move between different organisations and in some instances having the capacity to choose an organisation that has a better work design. 
Um, I, I think, you know, we've seen those shifts because of the pandemic in terms of different ways of working. I think we've seen those shifts in terms of organizations trying to be more innovative and open to structuring work in different ways. So I've seen those changes. Um, and so because of that, I think I have that optimism and particularly because of the, the, the transformations I've been fortunate enough to kind of see and, and tangentially being involved around the introduction of fantastic technologies to healthcare, which is such a challenging environment, but where such incredible advances have been made. Um, I, I, yeah, I'm, I think I'm optimistic because of the cultural shift around the importance of well-being and employee motivation. And because we've seen these little experiments here and there happen, um, you know, and and I think because when we look at the stats around changes in work, um, particularly with technology, although we will see these some instances of these jobs kind of, you know, disappearing or becoming a little bit redundant, ultimately what we're going to see more of is, is jobs changing and part of a job being automated. And so I think when that is happening, it creates opportunity that hopefully through research, um, through evidence-based practice, through you know, forums such as this, we can facilitate the seed of using those opportunities created by the introduction of technology and created by pressures from our you know, forever changing world environment that we can use those opportunities to create better work and continuously improve the way that we, that we operate. So I think overall I'm optimistic um, but, uh, you know, it definitely won't be a linear path and there are still plenty of challenges um, that are sort of between um, uh, us and, and what I would see as an ideal sort of situation. Well, yeah, that's well, it's good to hear that you're an optimist. That means we might have something nice to look forward to. Um, I'm conscious of uh, the time. We've gone a little bit over an hour, but maybe I, I'd like to ask. I have a few other questions I could ask you, but uh, maybe one I can ask first is, is there something you'd like to share with our viewers regarding work design or anything else that uh, you haven't already that you thought might be pertinent to mention? Something we didn't cover. Um, I'm just having a quick flick through um, at the slides that I put together, but I think we've covered, um, I think that's that's mostly, you know, I know, right. I suppose the last thing that, um, that um, not myself directly, but some of my colleagues are, are doing, which I think is a particular, it's sort of the intersection of work design and another really pertinent um, trend, I suppose, is, is that of the role of work design in an aging workforce. Mm, yes. Um, uh, you know, we have um, kind of, I suppose, uh, overlapping with the Future Work Institute, the Center for Excellence in Population Aging Research, CEPA. Um, and we've got some fantastic, I've got some fantastic colleagues doing work around um, the, the different elements of creating a workforce that is both inclusive of older workers, um, but also that, that capitalizes on the strengths and the benefits that they bring to organizations. So it's a little bit about, you know, debunking some of the myths and the stereotypes around older workers, creating opportunities for them to come into organizations where they might not otherwise or might be um, where other candidates might be kind of unduly favoured over them purely because of their age, um, but also around, um, yeah, it kind of looking at work design and looking at how maybe there are differences in what is the optimal work design at different stages of life. Um, you know, I think there's some early research that, um, that there's a difference in terms of task variety and skill variety in terms of what works best for older versus younger workers. Um, and there are some differences, for example, in how feedback might be received or what is the best way to deliver feedback. So we have some early research in that space. Um, and then there's a piece around, um, as I said, integrating the, the expertise that older workers may have into the teams and into the organization. So, you know, whether that's through sort of um, mentoring, um, mentorship relationships, whether that's through um, intentional efforts to make these sort of, um, you know, multi-generational teams, if you'd like to call it that. Um, yeah, there, there's, you know, if we are to uh, cope is the wrong word because it sounds too negative, but if we are to, I suppose, take advantage of the aging workforce, again, back to that thing of, well, you know, these things are happening. How do we make an opportunity out of it? If we want to attract older workers, um, if we want to ensure that they are productive in our organizations, and if we want to retain them, again, we can come back to these principles of good work design. Um, and other principles around inclusion and diversity 
to ensure that they are coming and staying um, and being productive in our organization. So I think that's another real opportunity for mm. for work design research, but more generally a focus on the, the psychological, the psychosocial dynamics that underpin what happens in the workplace. Mm. And yeah, that, of course, that'd be uh, of great interest to a few of our APL member countries, like the Republic of China, uh, mm. Japan, South Korea, that are kind of currently dealing with this problem of uh, rapid aging and how to kind of boost what you would ca could call like the silver economy. Mm, uh, mm. Actually, one last, well, maybe second last question I'd like you to kind of think through is, um, I know one of the kind of macro factors that you talked about when it comes to like the antecedents of work design is mm. about culture and the role of culture. Mm. And uh, our organization, the APO, has uh, 20, 20 active members, um, and it's quite diverse. We, we represent countries in South Asia, Southeast Asia, Asia, uh, and also some Pacific Island countries. Mm. So it's uh, each country is quite distinct. Um, mm. To what extent do you think the kind of framework of work design and the processes of practical work design, to what extent is it exportable to all these different contexts? Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I don't off the top of my head, although you'd really be testing me. So there, I think there are two parts to that. There's, is there um, empirical evidence or, or should there be around whether different types of work design are more or less um, effective in within different cultures? Um, and that's, to my understanding, not something that's been looked at in depth, although I think it's critical. And, you know, we struggle, um, particularly in psychology, unfortunately, with research that tends to be done in Western cultures um, and in particular tends to be done on university students rather than yeah. um, you know, people working in organizations. So but that's a whole other topic. Um, so I think there's scope for understanding whether different, um, you know, and I talked earlier about, for example, how feedback is received. Um, you know, I can imagine that would potentially differ, um, you know, in different cultures in terms of the way that feedback is given, the frequency, um, so you might find a different relationship between that psychosocial um, job resource and the outcomes that we would traditionally see in, in other kind of work design um, research. The other element, I think, of the cross-cultural um, dynamic is back to, as you say, those antecedents of work design. Do we see that different people from different cultures generally, and this is generalizing, have particular orientations or preferences towards um, designing work in a particular way that may not necessarily be reflective of what is the most effective. So, you know, if these, the models that we have of work design hold, but different people in different cultures are more predisposed to other ways of designing work, that might be a barrier to, to good work design and to productivity. Um, one example that I do know off the top of my head um, is a study that in particular um, broke down um, and it wasn't necessarily from an exclusively work design perspective, but from this literature around self-managing teams and that kind of, I suppose, also a management methodology. Um, and they broke it down in terms of, well, you've got self-managing teams and you're trying to introduce that into your organization. There's the self-managing part and then there's the team part. And so the team part, they found what manages acceptance or, or um, attitude towards the idea of self-managing teams for the team part was related to whether the culture was um, more individualistic versus more collectivistic or sort of communal. Um, and you can see that perhaps more communal cultures, more collectivistic cultures would be more comfortable in the, that social kind of um, working together environment as opposed to perhaps mm. Western cultures where they're more individualistic and about individual achievement. Um, and then there's the, the self-managing part, which comes back to the idea of autonomy. Um, how comfortable culturally um, and, I, and I think from memory, um, although I can't remember perfectly, that can be tied to um, quite a sort of classic um, cultural value in a, in a framework of cultural values around what we call power distance. So you know, how comfortable is the culture with having essentially a large hierarchy versus wanting to be really close to where decisions are made? And that would then, um, again, if you're in a culture that typically prefers hierarchy and has a comfort with decisions being made kind of way up the chain when you're down here, that this idea of implementing self-managing teams and thus autonomy would be quite aversive to people who hold those cultural values. So so I think overall it's a it's a massive um, opportunity yeah. and a real need to do more research in this space. Um, 
and and I, I'm, I think, but critical, as you say, to understanding both when and where a particular work design is most effective, but also how can we um, facilitate the design of, of better work? Great. Uh, and now final question. Uh, so for people, for our viewers who are interested in learning uh, a bit more about work design, uh, what kind of resources, people or organizations mm -hmm. do you point them to? Sure. Um, Obviously, incredibly biased, but um, we're, we're so lucky here at the so within the Future of Work Institute, we have the Center for Transformative Work Design um, and we have a fantastic um, team, uh, sort of operations team, marketing team who work with our academic researchers to put these ideas um, into more tangible, exciting resources. So if you go to our website, um, which I'm sure um, we can potentially post in, in some sort of comments or, or um, yeah. uh, details section, um, there is both um, resources about work design in general. There are resources about case studies of work redesign. Um, and um, we have uh, kind of generated a number of different resources, particularly around, um, for example, the COVID pandemic, working from home, um, other issues that that have work design, um, a, a work design basis, but are, are related to more kind of contemporary um, challenges that organizations and managers might be facing. So um, check out the website. Um, and then from there, you know, within that in a number of different places, we reference um, other reports that are being produced, um, other academic articles. So it's probably a good starting point for sort of really exploring this topic further. Great. Uh, and so with that, I think We'll, we'll come to a close. Uh, so we're a bit over an hour. Um, thank you for those tuning in. Uh, if you leave your comments under the video on YouTube, we'll, we'll try to get back to you in two weeks' time. And of course, if you have any other suggestions on topics that the APO can tackle, please let us know. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Georgia Hay for sharing her time and knowledge with us. I think you've given us a lot to think about, and a lot of kind of interesting uh, cases and also concepts and frameworks to, to reflect on. Um, so to our, to our viewers, we look forward to seeing you at our next productivity talk. Um, to get updated, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, etc. I hope everyone stays safe, happy, and productive. Thank you.